This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk about what exactly it is that makes Bitcoin decentralized. Decentralization, decentralized, these are terms that are thrown around, but a lot of people use them without really understanding what they mean. The real question is, why would you even want decentralization to begin with? And this is a question that a lot of altcoiners never even ask, because of course, decentralization has just become this cool marketing word that you can use to sell your own coin that you printed up. You can just say, oh, my coin's much more decentralized than Bitcoin. But no one ever really pushes on the definition to ask what it is that they're saying. So let's begin with the stark truth that I've mentioned before. Centralized services, centralization is almost always better. It's faster, cheaper. You get a better user experience, better customer service, better, more consistent marketing. Decentralization only makes sense in a few scenarios. Decentralization makes sense if you want to take power away from a central entity that could ban or censor you. Decentralization means things are going to be much slower, but they might make sense. It might make sense if, for example, you don't want to have to trust PayPal, which is a centralized entity, and you don't want to have to be subject to its censorship. So decentralization, one reason you might prefer it over centralization is that decentralization provides censorship resistance. PayPal, as we said, which is a centralized service, can ban or censor you at any time. Bitcoin, decentralized, cannot. So for example, you might not agree with the Canadian truckers and what happened to them earlier this year, but if you live long enough, your free speech and money are probably going to be censored too. And at that point, you're gonna want some Bitcoin. And your chief concern at that point is not gonna be how much it costs but whether you can even get your hands on some. This is what I'm referring to when GoFundMe uh, blocked and froze the money that was intended for Canadian truckers. So decentralization is one way of taking power away from a central entity, whether that's a corporation or a government that wants to ban or censor you. Decentralization is also serves another function, and that can be to remove the power, to take the power away from the central entity that can print up more tokens. And so decentralization is one way of enforcing scarcity. For example, the 21 million Bitcoin. A centralized authority with a printing press, they may promise not to print up too much money over a given period of time, but at some point the temptation always becomes too great. And that really began in 2009, 2008, 2009 in the US when the printer, printing press really took over. It happened a little bit earlier in Japan. And so if you give someone a printing press, at some point they will print. If they're very honest and ethical, they, they may not do it in their lifetime or as an office holder, but you can be sure that their successor or their successor successor will use the money printer. So for example, whenever the US government gets into trouble, the Fed, our central bank, the Federal Reserve, just prints up more tokens and uses them to fund the US government by buying its bonds. The U.S. government doesn't care that this devalues the savings of millions of people who store their wealth in U.S. dollars. And this is because the price and supply of U.S. dollars is controlled by a small group of people. This is the opposite of decentralization. So these are the two main use cases that I can think of for decentralization. It's to enforce censorship resistance and also to enforce scarcity. If you're finding this video helpful so far and you believe in this channel's mission of spreading Bitcoin education, I'd encourage you to help me out with the YouTube algorithm. Hit that subscribe and like buttons and leave a comment. So what is it that makes Bitcoin decentralized? I'll give you one obvious thing. Copies of the Bitcoin blockchain are found all around the world, probably in every single country on earth. Bitcoin blockchain is just the history of every Bitcoin transaction since 2009 and also how much unspent BTC, how much unspent Bitcoin is held in each Bitcoin address. So if you're a government who wants to destroy Bitcoin, one good way of doing it would be to wipe out all records of its transaction history. In other words, wipe out all copies of the blockchain. But that transaction history, that blockchain has now been copied and stored in so many places that it's no longer possible. And these copies of the blockchain are being updated in real time by the nodes that run them. And so this becomes increasingly difficult for governments to shut down the more nodes there are. When Bitcoin was just on Satoshi's computer, on his laptop, and Hal Finney's computer, it was still possible to shut it down. So Bitcoin definitely began in a centralized manner, and it made the journey to decentralization, which is a very, very difficult journey. I'm not sure there's another protocol that has done it, certainly not 
anything that has the size of Bitcoin. Here's a map of all the Bitcoin full nodes all around the world. We can see there are 15,000 of them that are reachable, and we can see that they're in every continent on Earth. Now, Bitcoiners are, obs are obsessed with running their own nodes, and I don't think any other crypto has the same culture. For example, most people in Ethereum prefer to trust large corporate nodes run by Infura. For example, what they connect to using their MetaMask wallets, sort of the automatic connection. But Bitcoiners are a much more stubborn bunch. We're not going to be easily persuaded to change the software that we run on our nodes. And so, for example, all the Bitcoin core devs could get together and make whatever changes they want to the code, but we will not run the code. This is a common misunderstanding outside of Bitcoin that somehow we have to do what Bitcoin core devs force us to do. But basically, Bitcoin core devs are here to serve the community. They're a bunch of great people. And even if they were to become hostile or captured or compromised, they could create updates, but no one would want to run their updates. And this is the power of having Bitcoin full nodes all around the world. So Bitcoin core devs, they can get together and make whatever changes they want, but we will not run the code. And it's important to note, Bitcoin, Bitcoin the network is not run like a democracy. Having more nodes does not give you more votes. For example, the US government could spin up a million new Bitcoin nodes, and it wouldn't matter at all to the existing Bitcoin network because either those nodes would be running hostile or different software, in which case they would be ignored by existing Bitcoin or nodes. If those nodes were running, if those US government nodes were running the same software, i.e. enforcing the same rules, the same consensus rules, then the US government would just be helping Bitcoin. Basically, this is very important to remember, if you're running software that contains different consensus rules, for example, how many coins there are, the max supply being 21 million, how many coins a miner earns each block, etc. If you're not running, if you're running a software that contains different consensus rules, you're basically off in a corner doing your own thing. Bitcoiners don't care. Bitcoin doesn't care. The Bitcoin network doesn't care because you're basically off playing donkey basketball while the rest of us are playing NBA basketball. And it might be fun to have a niche of donkey basketball, but you're doing something completely different. And it's not an attack on NBA basketball. In the same way, the US government running a lot of hostile nodes would not be an attack on Bitcoin. So that's one way of measuring decentralization. Are there lots of different real human beings in lots of different places running the software? And if so, that means it's very difficult for any single government or group of governments to destroy historical transaction records or force the people running that software to stop. The US could ban Bitcoin software in the US within its boundaries. Of course, this would be a free speech violation because Bitcoin is basically just code. But if they did that, first of all, it'd be very, very difficult to enforce. Uh, it'd be very difficult to go door to door and try to enforce this. But even if they did, Bitcoin would still be running in different, uh, in different countries. So this is one way of measuring decentralization. Are there lots of different real human beings running your software? Now you can ask yourself, are there many different real human beings who run an XRP or Cardano node? I would say almost nobody. These are very tiny communities. Most of the XRP nodes are run by the corporation Ripple, I would imagine. XRP and Cardano are basically corporate projects. They're unregistered securities, and there's a corporation or foundation behind them, and they're just trying to do a securities law workaround. At the end of the day, it's important to remember nodes are just computers running software. So for example, you can run Bitcoin Core on your laptop. You just download it for free and run it. But what's even more important than the fact that there's a computer there running the software is that there's a person behind the computer who makes a choice every day to keep running that software on that machine. And it's important what kind of person that is. Is he the kind of person who's going to stop doing it because it's socially frowned upon? Is she the kind of person who's going to stop doing it because her government bans it? And if he or she is a toxic, stubborn Bitcoiner, probably not. They're not going to easily give this up just because someone looks down their nose at them or someone tries to ban it. And this is why the social layer of Bitcoin is so important and why I've decided to focus so heavily at this point in my life on Bitcoin education, because Bitcoin is ultimately a social movement. It's code, but it's real people who decide whether or not to run the code on their computers. As such, it's only as good as a social movement. It's only as good as the people who are involved in it. 
And part of Bitcoin education is knowing why you own Bitcoin so you don't panic dump it at times like these, at very dark times like these, and also knowing how to store it safely so you don't leave your Bitcoin on FTX or at Celsius. Instead, you hold your own private key. So this social layer of Bitcoin is extremely strong. Bitcoiners are stubborn. They're highly educated. They're highly intelligent. When you compare them to Dogecoin holders or XRP holders or HEX holders or Ethereum holders or Cardano, Cardano holders, there's really no comparison. And you can view that in my comment section if you doubt it. So what's here's another question. If I can get more than 15,000 Cardano nodes spun up around the world, will it be more decentralized than Bitcoin? Because as we saw, Bitcoin has approximately 15,000 reachable reachable nodes. And the answer to this question is absolutely not for a couple of reasons. First of all, Cardano is a proof of stake protocol. That means that having more coins gives you more control over the protocol. It had a huge pre-mine. Insiders like Hoskinson own a lot of the coins, and so they have a lot more control over the protocol than small holders do. Bitcoin is very different because under proof of work, having more coins does not give you more control of the protocol. This is one thing that makes proof of work so special. Proof of stake coins, by contrast, are very easy for governments to capture. As we talked about on this channel many times before, it happened to Ethereum in just a few weeks after the merge, and Ethereum is now imposing US government OFAC censorship on 72% of the blocks over the past day, for example. This is US Treasury OFAC guidance, what transactions can be included, what transactions and addresses cannot be included, and it's actively being censored by these large staking pools that are imposing US government censorship on Ethereum. So Ethereum is basically dead if you're interested in a censorship resistant protocol. As we said, one way of measuring decentralization, are there lots of different real human beings in lots of different places running the software? I think that's a necessary condition, but is it sufficient for our definition of decentralization. For example, there are lots of different real human beings and lots of different places running Microsoft Windows, but that doesn't make Microsoft Windows a decentralized project, obviously. Here's the key distinction. How difficult is it to change that software and get all of these people to still agree to run it? Now, Microsoft, the corporation, has the power to change Microsoft Windows code whenever it wants and without getting permission from disparate groups. It's a centralized project. Like Microsoft Windows, Charles Hoskinson and the Cardano team have the power to make changes and everyone goes along with them because they have a bully pulpit. Cardano actually has a roadmap, which just doesn't exist in the Bitcoin space. You can see here the Cardano roadmap. It's another sign that you might be centralized if you have a roadmap that you can all agree to. By contrast, governance in Bitcoin is a complete mess because it really is, it really does have no one in charge. So unlike Cardano, unlike Ethereum, it's very difficult to change Bitcoin. This is the key to measuring how decentralized something is. How difficult is it to change the code, to change the rules? Is there a small group of insiders who can force through changes? And if so, it's not very decentralized. It's very easy for Microsoft to force through changes. It's very easy for Ethereum to force through changes. In fact, they do one hard fork after another, and almost everyone goes along with these forks. By contrast, it's very, very difficult to change Bitcoin. There's no one in charge. There's no one with a bully pulpit like Hoskinson with Cardano or Vitalik Buterin with Ethereum. And this is why Bitcoin is more decentralized than any other crypto asset in the world. In fact, I don't even like to refer to Bitcoin and crypto in the same sentence. Crypto is for the most part just tokens issued by corporations trying to skirt US securities law. Bitcoin is something extremely different. Now, altcoiners like to make fun of Bitcoin and call it a pet rock that never changes, but it, I, I'm always amused when they do this because they're not realizing, because they don't really understand this space, they're not realizing that they just paid it the ultimate compliment. The base layer of money should not be easy to change. It should be secure, it should be dependable, and it should change as little as possible so that people can make long-term economic decisions, so they can plan the future, so they have clarity and transparency into future monetary policy. We know the future monetary policy of Bitcoin all the way to 2040 when the last Bitcoin is mined. People need to be able to depend on money and not worry about it being changed in the short to medium term 
by some small group. Otherwise, you end up back with something like the Federal Reserve and the US dollar. And this is basically what proof of stake coins like Ethereum and Cardano are recreating, unfortunately. I'll say it one more time, the base layer of money should not be easy to change. It should be secure, dependable, and change as little as possible. And this is one of the things that makes it very good money. As we mentioned at the beginning of this video, Bitcoin's decentralization helps to enforce its scarcity and its censorship resistance as well. We know that there's no, no small group of people in charge who can force it to have a higher supply than 21 million. And so this is the importance of having something that is secure and dependable as your foundation. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. I want to wish all of you, especially my American viewers, a very happy Thanksgiving, which we'll be celebrating here tomorrow. I would just want to say and share with this, this uh, share with all of you that I'm grateful for this platform. And I'm especially grateful for you guys, my audience at this time of year. And of course, I'm grateful to Satoshi as well for making all of this possible in the first place. So I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving if that's something you celebrate. If not, I will certainly see you all, uh, God willing, on Friday.